Hi everyone, welcome to my presentation of My Kites Are Not Painted, a different approach to fabric dyeing and applique. Often when flying my kites I get people, both the public and kite flyers, commenting what a great painting that is on the kite. Even Microsoft software thinks the kites are painted when recognising the images to add to this presentation. My favourite kite type, the Della Porta, also adds to the flying a gallery effect, making the kites look even more like paintings in the sky. Whilst I take these comments as a compliment, I always have to point out that the kites are appliqued and dyed. There is no painting involved. In fact, I'm not good at painting at all. Much as I admire people who paint their designs on kites, I prefer the intense colours produced by my process. I also like the way the colours change depending on the light conditions. This presentation is about who I am, how I got here and the techniques I use to create these painted kites. Who am I? I'm Jill Bloom. I'm based in a small village just outside Colchester in the east of England. I've been making and flying kites and banners for over 40 years. I consider myself as a kite artisan and totally self-taught. I have no artistic background whatsoever. I also organise many kite festivals in the UK and are lucky enough to attend many international kite festivals around the world. So my creative journey. I started making very simple patchwork back in the early 80s. As you can see by the photograph, the trendy curtains, you can definitely see what era that is. Um, this, these were created on my mum's trusty Singer treadle sewing machine. This allowed me to learn how to use ripstop on a machine that worked slowly. Um, I got very bored with doing patchwork, so I decided to do something else. So then applique appeared. By then I had an electric sewing machine that did zigzag. Um, so this was one of my very first kites using applique. As you can see, it was very simple, but I was very pleased with it, as you can tell by the photograph. By then, I was very unhappy with the range of colours available to use to make applique. So I decided to try dyeing to provide the colours I wanted. As you can see on this Rikaku, the background is actually the dyed material. I also started using dye to create patterns on the material itself. So as you can see again on the frog Rikaku, the bark has been done with tie dyed to give the sort of bark effect. And then I've shaded darker ripped up onto the top. I perfected that method a bit later on. So I didn't have to applique stuff onto dyed material. This set of slides will show some early examples of my kites. This first one was a he large hexagonal kite made for the very first Weifang International Kite Festival in China back in 1984. I based the design on a motif from a Chinese box. It's actually peonies, which is obviously the Chinese national flower. The leaves were made just normal applique with a normal colour ripstop, but the peonies themselves were made with tie dyed. It's interesting, I've never managed to get that deep colour again. Here are some more. The one on the left was made with two methods. The leaves and the stem were made with just simple applique and then the veining and the shading was just added on top. And the blooms themselves were made from tie dyed ripstop, which was then layered up. I think there's about three or four layers on that just to give the depth of the flower. The one on the right shows some different techniques. The sky and the moon are produced with batik, um, just melting candle wax and putting it onto the ripstop. And in the buildings, the vertical patterns on the building is produced by resistance dyeing by putting sellotape onto the ripstop and then dyeing it. This kite still flies. Um, it still even has some of the wax in it. I think some possibility that the wax has actually helped to preserve the kite. This is one of my very early examples. Um, with a little bit of tie dyeing. The blue sky has actually been tie dyed and then put onto white ripstop. Everything else is just very basic applique and shading, and the veins are just done with stitching. To me, this looks very crude now, but it, I can see the genesis of my other kites in this in this kite. As you can see, 
nature and birds appear alone by kites. Uh, this one is done with a dyed background and mostly just appliqued material put on the top. Although looking at it, there is the bark of the tree has been tie dyed and the breast of the bird has also been uh, dip dyed to get the graduation on the red. So moving on a few years now, this kite was originally an Edo, but I've decided to turn it into a Della Porta because I got fed up sorting out the bridles every time I wanted to fly. Um, it's the same idea, so you have a dyed background and the flowers are also dyed and then shading and detailing has been put on either with extra ripstop or just machine stitching. On to the interesting bit, dyeing the ripstop. On the next slide I will go into some more details, but before that some safety tips. Uh, please, if you use a carry saucepan, make sure that it's not used to make your biryani afterwards. So all the utensils, wooden utensils and everything should be kept for dyeing only. Also wear rubber gloves. On to the dyeing process. The dye I use is Dylon hot water multi-purpose dye. The sort that you can find in most haberdashery shops and craft shops. It came to, comes in a range of colours and used to be presented in small metal tins, but these have been replaced by sachets. The small metal tins can still be found on eBay if you want some interesting discontinued colours. The sachets contain about five grams of dye, which is enough to dye about five metres of ripstop. Please note, this is only good for nylon ripstop. If you wish to dye polyester ripstop, then you need to use some other dye such as I dye poly. For the actual process of dyeing, I use a large curry saucepan and a pair of wooden tongs and rubber gloves. There is no need to pre-wash the ripstop unlike natural fibres, there will be no shrinkage or colour loss. Make up the dye solution as per the instructions on the sachet. A couple of pints of hot water and a couple of teaspoons of salt. Add the ripstop and top up with more hot water. Then gently simmer the ripstop. It is important not to boil the dye solution as the ripstop will definitely not like it. You can keep the ripstop in for as long as you like, but after about 15 minutes there will be no more colour uptake. Rinse the material under copious amounts of cold water. It is important to make sure that there is no more dye solution on the surface because if you use dyed ripstop for a kite and, and your kite gets wet and there is some dye left on the sail, it will run. I know, I've done it. Good. On here. Yeah. No. Finishing. So the, I have found the best way of fixing the dye is to actually iron it when wet. Because the ripstop is wet, you can actually use quite hot iron. It's just a matter of trial and error. If you melt the ripstop, the iron's too hot. You can experiment with the other kinds of dyeing, batik, multi-dyeing, or even using coloured ripstop as a base for dyeing, etc. It's really just a case of experimenting. Of course, there are other methods of dyeing ripstop. I'm sure Ron Bohart has a very good method of dyeing ripstop, judging by the number of colours he can produce. So it's just a case of looking on the internet to find one that works for you. Of course, if you want to find more of my method, you can actually look on my website, www.skyblooms.co.uk and there is a link to how I dye my material with a little bit more information on it. In order for you to understand my techniques, I have assembled a short video on how to do batiking and dyeing. Thank my husband, John, for acting as the cameraman. Pull those on the next slide. Welcome to 101 but teaking with a candle. Right, this is an ordinary domestic candle. It happens to be red because it's cheap Ikea candles after Christmas. Step one, light candle. Let the candle come up and start melting the wax. It's a couple of seconds. So, tilt the candle, as you can see, it's starting to melt. Oops, it's gone out. Fill the 
the candle, let it melt down onto the ripstop and using your finger, I tap this, spread it out and do whatever technique you want to do, bigger bobs, spots, Run it along carefully. Is it locked to your rip stop? <laughs> so, once the candle's melted a bit more, you've got quite a good angle, so you can then start doing long lines on it, like this. Please note, the, the wax isn't that hot, but if you think you might burn yourself, you can always wear a glove. So, there you can see I've got the finished sale. There's various techniques on here. There's longs and dots and everything. In a minute I will dye it and you will see the various effects that the different wax techniques have. Right, so also, I've just acquired this new tool. It's a proper batik tool. I think it's called something like a Tian Qing. Basically there's a hot, water, hot wax reserve in there and then a little tiny nozzle. So I will hopefully get finer control with this. I mean, this is basically done. You have a wax being melted on some sort of heating device and then it's, you dip, dip this in and then... So I will report back when I finish using this tool. So now you've got the wax actually onto the material. In order for the wax to have any chance of surviving a little bit in the hot water, you need to actually just gently bundle it up so it's not instantly attacked by the dye solution. So the way I do this is loosely bundle up. As you can see, the wax has gone inside. Loosely bundle it up and then just very loosely tie it around with some cotton. So, so you just end up with a very loosely bundled up piece of ripstop. Next process is dyeing. For dyeing, I don't normally do it next to the cooker, I have a separate area over on the right hand side but it's smaller so this is better to give you the general idea. Step one, previously boiled water Step two, putting the dyeing uh, gloves on presentation you can either use what I use which is a big tin which is quite expensive or you can buy the sachets right around, or the small tins if you can find them. It's basically got these have got five grams in them so if I'm using the big tin five grams is approximately heat teaspoon goes in like that put the lid on the advantage of using a big tin is if I want to, I can actually put more dye in and get a deeper colour. I now add the salt. It's ordinary British table salt that I presume American or any other kind of salt will do. Add to the water. Give it a stir. And put your oil on. Um, to start with, I'm just trying to heat it up a bit. Um, this isn't on temperature, actually, no, you can do temperature, so I will now tell you what temperature it is. It's 120 degrees, I've got it on centigrade. So, as you can see, it's actually just starting to boil. So, I add some hot water. It doesn't have to be boiled, it's just hot water from the tap. So obviously that stops it boiling for a little while. 
I now turn down the temperature to about 80. Give it another stir. Get the ripstop. Add the ripstop. Push it down. You've got two pieces of utensil to help. And obviously it wants to keep fights you because of the air in it. And ripstop is quite perfect, impervious to water. But as you can see, it's just starting to take up the colour. Right, so the ripstop's been in for mm, two or three minutes. So all you need to do is just agitate it to turn it over. Like that. As you can see, a little bit just went on my work surface. But it's fine because this is glass and I also have glass spat backs. But if you're using it on wood or stone, please protect your work surfaces because it will stain and you can look at it off. Right, so we give it a little agitation. You can see the colour is starting to develop now. And we just keep turning it over, basically to whatever colour you decide is how deep a colour you want. So as you can see, I've, the colour is what I want it to be. Temperatures are 80 degrees centigrade. So now we have to empty the dye out and rinse. Of course, if you want to keep the dye for another attempt, um, it will not dye as deep as this, but you will get some colour out of it. It is possible to just leave the dye in the saucepan. Um, it'll probably be okay for about a week. And I've also heard some people say they'll actually put it in a glass jar with a sealed top and it'll keep for a little bit longer. Right, this is my proper dyeing sink. When the kitchen was designed, it was actually designed for me to be able to have my own sink so it doesn't stain the main sink. So here we are. We put the saucepan in the sink. Add cold water. Side, empty the dry out, and empty all the rich stuff out in the ground there with the bowl. Make sure that all the dyes come out of the bowl because otherwise, when you dye with a different colour, there's bits left, they'll show up on the next piece of dye. So, there I am putting it on the side, as you can see in the sink. Now, this is a Sink, ceramic sink so I know that the dye doesn't actually stain it but if you're using something like a composite sink it can stain it so I suggest that you maybe check before you put it down your best kitchen sink all right so it's just a case of letting the main dye go as you can see you can see little bits of wax floating on there And in cold water, taking the string off, mm. and rinse. A few minutes on, as you can see, it's almost there. There's not much dye left, but we need to make sure that there isn't any dye trapped in pockets. So it's just a case of working your way through. A massage, which stop likes massaging. Um, and as you can see, it's actually now running clear. Just a tiny bit there, so I'll do another massage. don't normally iron in the um, kitchen, but this is easier. Right, so we've got normal domestic iron and an ironing board with a cover that's only used for ripstop dyeing. Alright, as you can see, well, the, the operator of the camera can get in that close. It's on maximum. Mm. So... 
Goes on wet onto the uh, cover. Now, this is going to sound weird, but there's a right and a wrong side of this lipstick. It irons better one side than the other, so make sure I've got it on the right side. And iron. As you can see, it's so wet that the outfit's got to coat with it and it just, it just uh, seems to steam it off. Do you see how, because it's such a hot iron, it actually steams. So I get through most of the creases. I will now quickly run through some examples using various techniques. This first slide is a set of banners made for the Leber Kite Festival. It represents a stormy sea. The bottom half of the banners is produced by batik application. Um, to get the very dark colours, I've put quite a lot of wax on that. And then the top section has been done with tie dye. So basically just scrunching it up and tying it to get the effect. The next step set is showing you resistance dyeing, this time using sellotape. This is a very simple method. It's basically just putting sellotape, or for the American scotch tape, onto the ripstop before you dye it. Obviously, the ripstop and the sellotape part company fairly soon once they're in the dye, but it does stay on long enough to get the effect. This last one is a new technique for me. It's a Japanese dyeing technique called the rashi where the material is folded up really tightly around a uh, PVC tube, you know, like a drainage pipe, and then put into the dye. I think the effect is quite unusual, and this is my new sale. I haven't made a kite of it yet, but it'd be interesting to see what develops from it. Where am I today? I've almost perfected the techniques I use, although still learning and discovering new te techniques all the time. I start with the full size sail, usually white, although it can be another colour if I want a different effect. I dip dye sections of the sail to provide, for example, sky and ground. And I add batik and tie dyeing to the sail. And I also possibly, if I want to say a bark tree or a piece of bark, will dye separate pieces of material using batik and tie dye effects. On this simple sail, I am using two different kinds of two dyes, the green and the blue. And it's merely a case of just leaving some sections of the sewing longer than others. For example, on the green, the bottom third has been obviously been in a lot longer than the top section. And this is resultant kite. As you can see, I've then batiked and tied dyed to get the bark effect. But you can still see just the original sew with the graduation of colours going through. This was a set of banners for Doha, so it had a sort of desert feel. This was produced with batik at the top to get the sort of reddish, sunny sort of sunset effect. And the rest were just graduated dyeing, although there are about four or five different colours of dye in this. And this is the final resultant set of banners. On this one, I used black dye to start with on white ripstop and it was done with some batik techniques and then I dyed the yellow on top of the, the grey area to get the sort of mixed colours and this is a resultant kite. Finally, I do sometimes produce sails for other kite flyers. This was produced for Roger Stevens and he did the design onto it. I think it's rather nice. I think he made a very good job. So after all that dyeing, batiking, etc, etc, down to sewing. This is my basic sewing equipment. It doesn't really take much to make a kite. I have two pairs of scissors, both Fiskar. I know there's an awful debate on which scissors are best, but these I have used for many years. And as long as you have a good scissor sharpener and keep them sharp, I've always done well with them. The soldering iron is a, has a pyrography tip, so it's very fine. 
and all else you need is a pencil and my trusty Singer 20U industrial sewing machine has given, has given me sterling service for 30 years plus. Now we're on to the building process. Perhaps the best way of describing this is, is if I follow through on a single kite, describing the various steps as I go along. This is going to be the tigress kite. I start with a basic white sail, which was then folded and crushed and tied to dye with a green. And then one side of the green sail was dipped into brown ripstop to get the brown effect on the left hand side. Here you can see me adding some detail to the background sail. If I can use my technique of making tree bark, basically the tree shape was cut out in white ripstop and then the ripstop was tightly folded and tied to create the vertical lines of the bark. It was then dyed in a brown ripstop. At the same time, I used the brown dye to dye some white material to produce the soil level at the bottom of the kite. Further along with the design, as you can see, the tree trunk has been sewn on and cut out from the back. On the right hand side, I have some grasses. I basically cut them out with white ripstop and these were dyed and then tacked on and sewn on into position. The white ripstop tiger was roughly shaped, cut out and placed loosely onto the kite sail, ready for me to decide what I'm going to do next. Further along, now I can, as you can see, I've joined the grass on the right hand side with some grass on the left hand side, done in the same way. So cut out in white, then dyed, tacked on, sewn on and the back cut out. I've also added some leaves at the top of the tree, also done in the same way. So these ones, the whole section of leaf was cut, leaves was cut out and then each individual leaf was tied to give an effect to the veining and then it was all dyed as a single piece of ripstop. Again, sewn on and the back cut out. Here you can see me starting on the tiger. For the legs and other pieces, I dyed some material to give us Fadey colour because that's almost impossible to find as a normal colour of ripstop. I then put the beige material on the leg and also the orange material on the leg. Then cut the white from behind, so thus you've only got one layer of beige or orange. And then I've added black and some more beige to get the, the fur and the camouflage markings, the black camouflage markings on the, on the fabric. These are all sewn on and cut away from the back. Some of the fur doesn't need to be cut away, it's just laid onto the beige and left just to give it a sort of more depth of colour. As you can see, I'm keep continually adding more details. Um, quite clear on the right hand side is that I've put the orange onto the white and then cut the white away. As you will see on the next side when I show you the back, you can see the difference between leaving the white and taking the white away. This gives you, this shows you what happens when you cut the white away. All you have left is the seams where the material itself has been overlaid on, overlaid on itself. But also that means that there's no white left once everything's cut away from the back. Um, some of the detail on this hasn't actually been cut away. If I look at it, you can see that most of the grass and the leaves have not yet been cut away. Now on to the interesting bit, trying to get the face correct. I had to have a couple of goes at this because the first one just didn't look correct. It's the same idea. So you've got the basic background, the beiges and the oranges already sewn on, and then you're cutting out black strips and other shading elements and sewing them on, or hot tacking and then sewing them on.
but you can see some close up of my workings. This is all very crudely done and a lot of the um, sort of shading and the black and everything once it's sewn on is then cut back with a pair of scissors to get fine detail and neaten everything up. Um, as you can see a lot of the sort of fur technique is done by actually fringing the ripstop and then sewing the ripstop off. Just notice on here there's lots of pieces of cotton but I never cut the cotton off till right till the end. <laughs> As I go along, I'm always sort of looking and thinking hmm, that doesn't look quite right. And things get changed a lot as we go along. For example, here you can see I've added the white chin to the tiger and also moved the eyes and the ears. Eyes are important. If you don't get the eyes right, the thing never looks right. Here is a backlit photo of the sail and it shows you more details of the stitching. You can see where I've used the stitching to highlight so the fur effect of the cat. Um, again, you can see that sometimes in various areas I've added more material back onto it to give it a darker shade. Here you can see the finished sail. It's back lip to check if anything not a cutaway that should be. Just needs the edges taped, pockets added, frame and bridling. And of course, all those thousands of pieces of cotton cut off. And of course, what I haven't mentioned in the past that every different color of ripstop has the appropriate color of thread. So for example, the tree leaves will be green. The tiger will be orange, black, white. So there's a lot of cotton to cut off. <laughs> Here's a photograph of the back of the kite showing the technique quite clearly. And as you can see, most of the white ripstop has now disappeared. It's only left in very small numbers of seams. Um, and here is the kite flying in all its glory. Sometimes I do things differently. For example, here I have taken a single piece of white ripstop, applied my various techniques and then dyed it in one piece. I then look at the finished dyed up piece of ripstop and think mm, that edge of that ripstop would look nice as an edge of a petal. So I've actually cut the petals out onto the, from the ripstop depending on where the different shades are and then I've sewn it onto the sail in the normal way. I can then add directly onto it various leaves or in this case stamens or anything else can just be sewn onto it. One thing I thought I ought to mention as well, this isn't a variation, it's the way I do it. Everything I do is on the floor. So no tables or grass tables are involved in making any of these kites. So what is different from the normal applique process? There's better colour choices and effects through dyeing the material. No black lines between the colours. The thickness of the seams has been minimised to reduce fabric weight. It uses less material, less wastage as multiple full size layers are not used as in the typical applique method. No computer programs are used to blow up or reproduce images. I only use straight stitch, not zigzag. Of course, there are many ways of doing applique. And as you can see on my journey through making kites, I have tried quite a few of them. So go out there and explore your own methods. Thank you for your attention. If you've got any questions, I will now switch over to the live feed and we can do a Q&A. Look forward to hearing your questions. Bye.